All right, I have 12.30. So given that we are barely on the edge of the end of build 2015, why don't we just march forward and, uh, and start. So uh, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate you coming out on Friday afternoon to uh, talk about Azure Media Services. Just by a show of hands of the folks in the room, how many of you are already very familiar or somewhat familiar with Azure Media Services and the capabilities that we have? About three quarters of you, that's great. So uh, you're in for a treat. Uh, we have two sessions back to back talking about our media services platform as part of Azure. Uh, I'm going to talk today about what's new in the, in the last uh, several months in, that we've added to the platform. And then my colleague Ming Fei Yan will talk after me in the following session about a deep dive on how developers can begin quickly to use that. So, um, so I hope you get to stay for both. But if you don't, uh, I think it should be very enjoyable for all of us. So let me introduce myself. My name is Martin Wall. I'm a principal program manager in the Azure Media Services product engineering team. And I have the distinct honor of having the role of global engagement manager. I work with our customers and partners around the world, trying to help them uh, solve conundrums of how to use the cloud for streaming video and media uh, into their business and everyday applications. And we've built a pretty extensive and powerful platform that uses our cloud infrastructure to deliver video to any device anywhere in the world. And I'm going to use this session to talk to you about that capability and how you can use that yourselves and, and, and how you can develop with it. I do want to, as always, remind everyone that it's always very vital and important for us to get your feedback on each of these sessions and certainly for help, helping us to plan what is important to you and what's valuable to you for next year. So please uh, take the opportunity to submit an evaluation online or uh, after. So here's what we're going to talk about in this session. I'll give you a brief overview of what is Azure Media Services, even though I, I did recognize that many of you raised your hand and are already familiar with it. I brought with me some great customer examples of some deployments that are already in the market today. And uh, I'm going to try to show you what I can uh, and uh, walk you through them. Because a visual, I mean, this is media after all. So you know, if I do too much in PowerPoint, then I'll probably lose, lose our name. So uh, I brought that with me. And then I'm going to talk about a lot of the new stuff. And there's been a lot of new stuff on this platform. Uh, there have been a great deal of announcements, a great deal of feature ads, and uh, a lot of response and feedback that we've gotten in the last several years since we deployed this platform from our customers, from you, or the developers, as to what we should be adding and how we should enhance the platform. So I'm going to walk through a lot of this stuff uh, in the course of this session. But let me just back up and do a, a brief overview as a reminder as to what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is the fact that we all know this to be the fact that video is the way we all pretty much communicate on a regular basis, whether we're talking in our regular daily lives in terms of as consumers or whether we're talking about as employees of organizations. Video is the way that we all like to entertain ourselves, be entertained, and communicate with our fellow colleagues. And everyone has in their pocket a device, some of you have three or more, that are capable of playing high motion, high definition video. And uh, you use them on a regular basis. Maybe you use them to watch and consume your own entertainment content. Maybe your company uses them to entertain and or educate and train you. Um, but these are, these are the way of the world. This is how we all work today. And every company on the planet has taken advantage of the fact that you can use streaming mini media, streaming video, to deliver this content. But it's also gotten quite expensive. We know that in order to provide high quality video everywhere, uh, you've got to have quite an infrastructure to support it. And what's more so is that uh, while putting videos up on the internet and sharing them with your friends, colleagues, and, 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 and customers is not relatively new, what is becoming more and more new is the fact that we're doing a lot more live streaming. I hope some of you have taken advantage of ta uh, seeing that Channel 9 has been live streaming this conference uh, on their web page. And they've been doing that using the technology that we're talking about today in this room, Azure Media Services, as the cloud infrastructure to provide that. And doing live streaming, that can be challenging. That can be hard, and it certainly can be very expensive. But we think at Microsoft that the cloud infrastructure that we've put together is precisely the kind of resource that you as developers can use to help you drive new video streaming applications, whether they be around live or on-demand content. So we built this platform called Azure Media Services. And it's based on the premise that you can take any content from any source anywhere, whether it be a live stream or whether it be recorded video that you edit or create or produce, move it to the cloud, process it in the cloud, and then distribute it around the world to any device that can play video, which for all intents and purposes is every device. Now, of course, you'll notice that this is 
important to say that there are lots of different kinds of devices on the planet, between phones and tablets, television sets and set-top boxes, PCs and smart TVs. Nearly everything can receive a stream of video, and nearly everything can display it. So if your goal as a content owner is to distribute your content to the widest audience possible, then that's precisely what we've tried to do with Azure Media Services, is to give you a cloud platform that can very easily and very cost-effectively get your video content anywhere you want it without you having to have the necessary, uh, necessary have to build the infrastructure yourself. Now, this platform is pretty broad and pretty widespread. And while I'm not going to do a deep dive into each one of these areas, what I wanted to point out was, of course, the entire flow from end to end, from the point at which you submit a piece of content. And again, I'm talking about content as being both video file-based content, or it could be live stream content. You submit that to the cloud, to any of the data centers that are, that are being operated around the world. And you allow the cloud to do the heavy lifting, the encoding of that content, the protection of that content, the streaming and distribution of that content, and even the playback of that content onto the devices that you want to hit. This is what we mean when we say Azure Media Services. This is a collection of resources at your disposal, at the developer's disposal, to take advantage of as you would any other resource that's running in Azure today. So Media Services is just another part of the Azure offering that we do today, but it's specifically focused around video and video delivery. Now, many, many companies around the planet have taken advantage of this, and they've developed applications, some of which you might be familiar of using yourself, and maybe some of which you're not. But they use the cloud and the cloud resources to create really cool applications that enable them to hit whatever their business needs are. And you'll recognize a bunch of these, but I thought I'd bring a couple of them that you might find uh, uh, even more recognizable. So there was this little event that happened a couple of months ago. Let's just call it the Super Bowl. Any football fans in the audience? This year was brought to us by our broadcaster in the United States, NBC, and NBC Sports. And what did NBC want to do? Well, of course, they want to maximize the viewing audience of the Super Bowl. Now, for years, of course, everyone's been watching TV of the Super Bowl at home or in parties. But of course, more recently, now you've, the broadcasters and the content owners have wanted to stream this content, to provide it to you on a mobile device so that wherever you are, whether you're going to the store to get more beer, or you're going to the refrigerator to pick up another beer, or you're even taking a restroom break, you don't have to miss a single moment of the action. And so when we worked with NBC to look at what could they do, what could the cloud do to provide them with a streaming platform, they were very excited to be able to say, hey, it sounds to us that Azure already has all this built. So all we have to do is bring the game to the cloud, and the cloud will bring the game to our viewers. And that's precisely what they did. So NBC, during the Super Bowl on February, streamed the entire game, including all of the pre-game fun and post-game fun, and streamed it to all the devices that anyone could use in their hand or at home um, to two and a half million people who watched at one point in time. Now, you might not think that's a really high amount, given that we know that the Super Bowl is one of the most watched sporting events all year long. But in the last couple of years, that number of people who have watched sporting events on devices has been increasing, almost quadrupling year after year after year. Last year, it was only around six to 800,000 viewers watched the Super Bowl on a device, and this year it was 2.5 million. So that's pretty exciting. What's also exciting for us at Microsoft is to notice the bit that said, well, you know, even though the Super Bowl was one of the highest, most watched events of the year, for us, this was just another day at the office of the cloud. The capability of, that was necessary to deliver the Super Bowl, the resources necessary to deliver the Super Bowl so that not a single person who tuned into it would get spinning arrows or black screens or a dropped frame or bad quality, didn't even register as a blip on the infrastructure that we provide, because this cloud is pretty powerful. Now, we don't expect everyone in this room to have a Super Bowl-like event on a daily basis. But you can just imagine the capabilities that are at your disposal if you want to do an event of this magnitude. What was another event that we did last year? Well, what is now the most watched sporting event in all of sports history? That was the FIFA World Cup in Brazil in last summer. This event, which of course is seen by billions of people around the world, was also streamed, in this case, by 10 different broadcasters around the world who used the Azure Cloud to also uh, distribute the stream to a variety of different players and client apps that were built using Azure Media Services to deliver it. And what's so interesting about this is that the broadcasters who did this didn't just want this to be an experience of watching the game as you would on a television set. Oh, no. They wanted you to have a different experience. 
They wanted the cloud to enhance the experience, to innovate. So what about providing a synchronous data feed alongside the video scene feed that's timed with the smart client that's capable of pulling things like where are the players on the field at any given time and statistics around them? Or maybe this one, which some people lo would love to be able to control the camera angles that they see when they're watching the game and watch the coach of the opposing team or the particular star player or maybe uh, a particular angle. These smart clients gave viewers the capability of choosing the, the angle, choosing the video stream that was all traversing the Azure Media Services cloud in, uh, network. So even though the game was being broadcast on one video stream, you, with a digital device, had the choice of up to six or eight different uh, angles, camera streams that you could take. Now, other companies around the world are deciding that you know, what I want to do is be able to deliver new programming to digital devices that I wouldn't be able to do if I had to only do it via the cable or over the airwaves or satellite. So take Fuji Television Network, which is one of the largest broadcasters in Japan. They have a f about two or three different broadcast channels, but they have way more programming than they can air on those terrestrial channels. So what did they decide to do? Well, what they decided to do was create a channel that streams only to digital devices, have an over-the-top channel only. In this case, and I'll bring you, bring you, show you an example of this, because I think we can dial into Japan even while we're waiting here and see if it comes up. Now, of course, it's around 4 or 5 in the morning in, in Japan right now, so one never really knows what Japan is playing at any given time. Looks like they've got some music videos going on. But this is a 24-hour channel yeah. that exists only out of the cloud. And this broadcaster... Oh, we can turn that down just a bit, maybe. Thank you. I, could get I think you get the idea. But this is just a broadcast channel. But it's a cloud broadcast channel. And if you think about it, I'm going to go ahead and turn that off. If you think about it, the world of television is changing. All of us can now be broadcasters. All of us can now carry content that the cloud distributes to digital devices that might be an audience in the millions all around the world just through the power of cloud. And if I told you that it only took five minutes to spin up a channel like that that could be delivered to millions of people, your head might spin, especially when you think about someone like Oprah Winfrey, who spent about $850 million of her precious dollars to create her network, and it took about 18 months to do it. So think about how revolutionary this technology can be in the hands of very creative people, which I know all of you are, of course. You, too, can become a broadcaster of channels that are carried, like Fuji TV does, and they can be able to hit devices and really expand their audiences. If you've traveled to Tokyo and you talk to the folks from Fuji, as I have, what they say is the whole next generation of television watchers don't even watch TV on a TV anymore. I'm a father of a teenage daughter, and I certainly can attest to the fact that I never see my daughter watching TV on the TV, although she sits in front of the TV with it on while watching TV on her tablet. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Now, another type of use of this technology is for companies that themselves have, have content rights, but they don't have any broadcast or over-the-air rights themselves. Take a company like NGSN. This is a great example of a company that just purchased all of the rights to air soccer leagues out of South America and Europe and stream them to viewers here in North America, but they're not viewing it with any physical infrastructure whatsoever. This is an entire television network that exists only in the cloud. It's a pretty outstanding and amazing concept when you think about it. And I have a sample of what this looks like, too, on my laptop here. So I'll just switch over to that so you can see it. So at NGSN.com, any of you can go to it. And I think if you go soon, they're still giving away about a 90-day free subscription. So if you're a big fan of soccer, you can watch any game that might be happening at any time. Some of the games are live, happening right now. If I refresh the screen, we'll see if uh, we, we can... Uh, if we can see what's, what's playing right at this very moment. Some of the games are live, and of course, some of the games are already in the past. But the cool part of this technology is you can be a viewer of soccer games even if you're 5,000 miles away. So what you're watching right now is a live broadcast of a game going on right now being distributed only through the cloud. You cannot watch this content anywhere else. And uh, this technology that's doing it, of course, is using 100% Azure technology. Now, this is very exciting for the business owners of this business, but it's certainly also very exciting for all of us consumers. Because if you're a soccer fan, you know there's very limited ability to get a lot of great European and South American soccer 
here in the US. But here we have a service that's providing it. And as I said, if you go right now, you'll be able to get a free subscription. So that's pretty cool. Now, how do they, how do, they do this, you might ask? Well, I told you, they have no physical assets at all. Therefore, everything that they're doing is currently running in the cloud. And this gives you a sense of the architecture that's been used. They send their streams from the venues of the soccer, where soccer is taking a place all around the world. They send them into the cloud. They add commentary. They encode them in the cloud. They provide them and distribute them via the cloud. And they send them through our content dis uh, delivery network, or CDN, to players all around the, uh, the US, any type of device that you might be having in your pocket. And of course, all of the other management services, like billing and subscriber management, are all being done in the cloud, too, using a combination of technologies you're probably already familiar with, such as Azure SQL and Azure Cache and APIs and that kind of thing. This is an entire business that didn't exist before the cloud and is now hoping to be the next sort of, as the CEO of NGSN puts it, I want to be the next Netflix of soccer. Other types of applications used in the cloud are pretty, they're pretty numerous. You can imagine that there are companies around the planet that are doing things like, I make, do digital post-production, I make commercials, I make movies for a living, and I'm gonna use the cloud to distribute and share my videos. Or maybe I do those hotel entertainment systems that some of us may or may not still be using these days. Certainly on cruise ships or at uh, other sort of hospitality industries where streaming video content is the way that they bring content around in, uh, these days. How many of you have been in an elevator or a gas station and seen video screens that are there? Well, they're not gonna be just there anymore. Stores around the world are now putting digital screens, digital signage in their store, and they're streaming video content through the cloud so that they can provide you real-time information about the products that you know you want to buy. I just talked to a manufacturer of one of those devices and he's added motion detectors. So as you walk down the aisle with your cart at the grocery store, a video can play to you and advertise that next hot box of cereal that you really just have to try. I know this sounds a little minority report, but this is happening right now, and the cloud is making it really easy to deploy it. And also in the enterprise, I certainly know it's true that at Microsoft they make us watch a lot of videos about how to interact with you guys and, and uh, behave ourselves. But companies around the planet use the cloud and streaming video to train and educate their employees. So they're building video portals, portals that are just web pages that enable you to host videos. Some of those videos might be live, and some of those videos might be pre-recorded and distribute them using the cloud. So the cloud has so many different applications, so many different things that you could be doing with it. For example, in the medical field, I learned recently about a live streaming of surgeries that took place, a big event in the medical industry, where doctors and surgeons around the world from 10 different hospitals all put a camera in the surgery room and shared live surgery so they could train and talk to each other via the cloud. Now, how quickly was it to do this? About 10 minutes and a little miniature camera that they hooked up to their laptop beaming that s signal to the cloud and allowing the cloud to do all the heavy work. All they had to do was share with their colleagues the web page where that video f uh, could be found. And I already mentioned the ability for you to create your own enterprise solution. If you peel underneath that, what you see is that as I've been talking about, all this functionality is exposed to you, our developers, through an API. So as companies around the planet try to decide what's the best thing that they can do, what are their goals and objectives that they want to use the cloud for, we've provided a really powerful API to make it possible very easy and very quickly. APIs that enable you to go from a video that sits locally on your desktop to a video that now can be streamed to any device anywhere around the planet. So with that, I've given you an idea of some ideas of how some customers and some of our partners are using this technology. Let's look at some of the new stuff that we've added in the platform that's made all of this possible. So the first thing I want to show you is the fact that I know many of you are developers, and I know many of you love to code, but if you happen to be a kind of type who wants to look for a very quick and dirty way to get one of these applications up and running, well, we've created a tool for you that you just got to have. It's called the Azure Media Services Explorer. And I highly recommend you take a look at this tool because this does all of the API work that you would otherwise have to do built into the tool. I'm going to show you what that tool looks like in real time so you can take a look at it and how it, how it works. This is the tool running on my uh, Windows 8 laptop here. I've downloaded it from that website. And what it allows me to do is do everything that I've just been talking about, every functionality of Azure Media Services built into a desktop tool. So if I want to say, for example, go up here and upload a piece of video content that's running on my, that I have locally, like this Holo, HoloLens uh, uh, video that was just published yesterday, 
which I just picked up. I go and I find it locally, and now I'm just going to push it to the cloud. And the tool will do that for me. It's writing into my blob storage account for me. That's all I had to do. Very easy. Now, of course, you could have done that through an API running in Visual Studio, but this tool kind of saves the time. And here it is, stored in my, in, in, my, in my account. Now, once that video now exists, I might want to encode it. I might want to encode it so that it can be playable on any device on the planet. How do I do that? Of course, there's an API for that, too. But I could also use the desktop tool just to go encode the asset with our cloud-based media encoder. Once I choose that, it gives me all the choices for different uh, ways that I might want to encode it. But I want this to be encoded in adaptive bitrate streaming. I want this to be encoded with 720p resolution. So I'll just go and launch based on the default setting. And it starts kicking off a job. It sends a job to the cloud for me. Of course, using an API to do that, the tool takes that place. And that job is going to start, and I've got a cloud-based encoder that's running that will pick up that and encode that video file. Now, that's going to take about three or four minutes to work. So rather than make you wait around and, and wait for that, I already got one. I already did one earlier. It's right here. This is the encoded version. Now, what you'll see, of course, is that I default set it so it would create eight different bit rates. That's different bit rates for different devices, depending on what network you happen to be on. Right? And then, once I've encoded it, I'm just going to publish it by creating a locator, a streaming URL locator. Oops. Let me try that one more time. Publish. Create locator. There we go. So I'll create a locator. It defaults to a year from now. That's plenty fine. I'll go ahead and create that. And what it's doing now is it's pushing, pushing a URL out so that I can now give that URL to anyone I want to, and that URL becomes a streamable locator URL that anyone can play. Once that's done, all of the locators for all of the things that I've just published are available. And I'll show you what that looks like. Now, what's so cool about this Azure Media Services Explorer tool is it's got all the stuff baked in already. So all the things that you'd want at your disposal are here. I might want to encrypt that file. I might not want everybody in the world to be able to play it unless they have a license key. So I could easily encrypt it. Or I could make it clear. Here are the locators right here. Here's the one for smooth streaming. Here's the one for MPEG Dash. Here's the one for HLS v4. Here's the one for HLS v3. Now, you might say, great, you have to hand out all these locators to all these people all around the world, depending on which device they have. And as long as they quick click the right locator on the right device that they're playing, then they'll get the video. And you would have to say that. That's true. Until just quite recently, when something else really magical came out from our development team. And that's what we call the Azure Media Player. The Azure Media Player is a cross-platform player that automatically detects what you are running it on and pulls down the video in the format that matches your device. Don't believe me? You can try it for yourself. Here's a website, aka.ms.ampdemo. Feel free to go to that anytime you like. The idea, of course, with the Azure Media Player is it knows what device it's running on. And so you don't have to do the heavy lifting. If you're running it on an Android phone, It'll pull down the format that Android can handle. If you're running on an iPhone or an iPad, it'll pull that down. So what I can show you is what that looks like on my laptop here. I'll go ahead and switch back. So I'm using the Azure Media Player on Internet Explorer. That's, I just uh, went ahead and played that file that I just published. That's what it looks like on IE. I can go full screen, of course. This is an adaptive bit rate being pushed from the cloud. Right? That's kind of what it looks like. Now, this is a, a demo website, of course. This is the player's own website. And what, it, what, it, what I can show you is that I can take the link to this URL, and I can cut and paste it and put it into another website and show you how the player is portable. So I've got a website running here. This is my video collection site. This is just running in Azure. Uh, it's just a silly uh, website based on Orchard. And if I go into Orchard here, and I'm going to go cr modify this page, uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a link to that video that I just published on this page. So let me go ahead and do that. I'll go to the page that's running, just the home page. I'm just going to edit an HTML web page. And you can always do this on anything. Here it is. I'll say, this is a cool HoloLens video that I just put up in the cloud. And at the bottom, 
After that, I'm going to cut and paste my embed code from the player. And this is going to show up as an iframe, an iframe that has the player already attached to it. So you know how everybody gets used to sending like YouTube links around, and you email them, and you put them on your Facebook. Well, why should YouTube have all the functionality, and also manage all of your content? Think of this as a way to get that same functionality, but it's your website. So now I have my link into my web page, and it comes with the player because it's a hosted player. All right. So I'm going to save this and publish it. Oh, of course that's going to happen right in the middle of my demo. That's not fun. Publish, please. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and see what it looks like when I go to that web page. Now, here's the web page again, but now it has the video link. And it's playable. Now I'm on somebody else's website that's playing it. Now, if you don't believe me, if you think that there's some sort of trick I'm doing up my sleeve, I've already given you a URL, so you can try this yourself. Here it is. aka.ms build slash build AMS. Feel free to do this on any of your devices. The idea here is that the player works on whatever device you have, and that you can embed now videos into all of your web pages or your web applications. Really easy. So the player solves a huge, huge challenge. And what is that challenge? Well, it's been so hard to be able to put video into your applications because you had to have so many different versions of your applications in order to make sure that it ran. You had to have a Flash version and Silverlight version, maybe. Maybe you had one for iOS. Maybe you had one for Android. You know, and then your playback was always very complicated. But now with the cloud, we've solved a little of this. Two things are happening here. One is we've got a player for you that plays on any device that you try it on. One one code plays on all places, HTML code. And the second is that the cloud auto converts the format of the video to match the protocol that your device works on. We call that dynamic packaging. Now. If you remember from the tool, and I'll go ahead and go back to my tool here. I don't know if you noticed this, but there's a whole lot of URLs that got created when I published that video file, these locators. But this is the one here. I'm going to zoom in on it. See this one right here? This was the only one that I put in that link. That link, that's the one that I put in the link to, on the web page. In other words, we use the power of the player. And what we call dynamic packaging from the cloud to have the cloud auto detect what device you were playing on and deliver you the video in exactly that format. So, this is how you really can simplify your development efforts by only publishing your content once, only encoding your content once, and only creating a client once. In other words, really make it easy to share video. Now, that video file that I just played for you, which was that、uh, HoloLens video. From the, from the build show, that could have just been an e- as easily a live stream. So you see, I could have done exactly the same thing using the exact same player, exact same way to do it, and just embed a live video stream into a website. That's how easy it is. And all you got to do is start the camera and start, start the channel running. Very, very powerful. But that's exactly what we wanted to do for you guys, the developers. So let me switch back to the PowerPoint presentation. So, it's really easy, all, as easy as taking a bit of code, a little HTML, a little JavaScript, throw that into your web page, and suddenly giving yourself the power of video right, right away and let the cloud do it all. And here's that website one more time, if you didn't get it,、uh, of what I just showed, which was my, my website just playing the video embed that I showed you. And you can play around with that if you like. And if you're still looking for that URL of the Of the Azure Media Player demo, feel free to visit that site and you can get it there. Now, the features of the player, because this is so new, are going to grow over time. We've got quite a lot of things that we're adding. Now, all of these things are coming because of the feedback that we're getting from our developers and our partners. You are telling us what are some of the cool features of the player that you'd like us to add, and we're adding that into the, into the capabilities. So, as we move through time, and we just released this. Only a couple of weeks ago. This is brand new, the player, the Azure Media Player. So we're hoping you'll take advantage of it, take a look at it, and give us some feedback and tell us what kinds of things you'd like us to add. It works on all manner of browsers, devices,、uh, and it also supports encrypted content. And that's very important, too, because we all know that our content is valuable. 
for some people in the industry, you know, your content is the most invaluable thing that you have. So you don't want to just willy-nilly publish it everywhere. You might have business logic or rules about who should be able to see it. And you might want to sell your content, as is the case with some of the sporting events or entertainment content that we work with all the time. So the ability to encrypt your content is very important. <coughs> and that's part of what we offer at Azure Media Services. All right, let's move on to something else. Now, maybe you heard about our new media intelligence features within Azure Media Services. We released a product in the fall called the Azure Media Indexer. Now, this is really awesome technology. <coughs> Part of what we've done is taking the same technology that's been built into products like the Digital Assistant Cortana, or perhaps in Connect, or maybe you've used our new Bing Translate or Skype Translate services, where we're taking the power of speech and we're converting it into text. In that way, you can search through your video libraries for keywords that were spoken in the video. And what it will be able to do is help you build the database so that your application, your search application, can use video assets the same way you might Excel spreadsheets or Word docs uh, to find keywords. It, of course, has to work in multiple languages. So we've released it now in English and Spanish with uh, languages like Chinese and Japanese, German, Italian, French, Portuguese. All of them are going to come. Now, what does this look like? So I'll, I'll give you an idea of what this technology looks like as well. Go ahead and switch back. <coughs> so here we have my friend Joe, who's doing a HoloLens presentation. And what I did is I took his video and I submitted it to our indexer. Now, how do I do that, you might ask? Well, before we get too far in the demo, why don't I just show you where that lives? Here was the video that I uploaded. And look right here, index the asset with a asset media, Azure Media Indexer. Of course, there's an API for it, that too. And when I kick that off, it'll begin to index that video file right away. And it'll produce for me the entire transcript of the spoken words that were in that video automatically. The accuracy is pretty good. It's about 92 to 95% accurate. That's not 100% perfect, but that's a pretty far way down the path of you transcribing automatically all of the video content. So I'm going to play the video file, and what you can see is the indexer just went through the video file line by line and created the closed captioning track, the index track, with the time codes associated with it. And then it dumped all of this file, <coughs> all of this data, into a file that looks like this, this XML file with the track itself, which is completely editable. So if there were words that Joe said, that we didn't recognize, well, that's OK, because you can go back and edit it later. Now, you might think, well, that's really fascinating. That's certainly saved me a lot of time. I was able to quickly index and, and create the closed captioning track for all my videos. But what can I actually do with that, you might ask? Well, I've got an answer for you. Take Science Cinema. This is run by one of the government science labs in the United States. They've taken about 1,000 or 10,000 videos, and they have indexed their entire video content library. They're all science videos about astronomy or astrophysics. And so they often have a lot of requests from their constituents and the people who use the service for particular videos about particular topics. Makes sense, right, research institution? But when you have so many videos, how do you know where in the video those particular topics are? Let's just say, for example, I was interested in looking for all the videos that had the phrase binary pulsar in it, because I'm doing a paper on that, or I need to find information about that. Well. What this does is search for the entire library that they've got and pulls out for me all the videos that have the word binary pulsar in it. Now, that's interesting, but then I'd have to watch the whole video. Nope, I sure don't. Because of the way that the indexer works, I can jump right to the part of the video where that person is going to sp speak and say that thing that I'm looking for, which is the binary pulsar. And the player, which they've embedded into their website here, will just play that part of the video right at that point. So you get the idea. You can build pretty impressive video content, video applications, that search and say exactly what the, con what the viewer wants. You to wants. really helps you personalize your video content library. Now this technology, this indexing technology, can not only just do words today, but in the future, imagine what we're adding, and hopefully in future builds I'll be able to show you this, facial detection to find people inside your video, or maybe image detection 
I want to find a particular graphic or a logo inside my video. Or how about sound effects, the sound of a gunshot, or maybe the Eiffel Tower? Just imagine if video was just as easily searched through as every other type of document that we keep and share. And that's precisely what this is really all about, bringing media intelligence and content enhancements and metadata to the video content that you, that, that you use on a regular basis. Pretty cool stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, live streaming. I talked about that when I opened. And as I said, Channel 9 has been broadcasting and streaming uh, the Build Conference uh, this week. And they've been doing Azure Media Services to do it. Go check out their website, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, what were the necessary components in, in order to make that happen? I thought I would walk through that with you so you can get a, take, take a look at this. The first thing, of course, is you have to get your content to the cloud, the, your live content to the cloud. So we have really enhanced the Azure Media Services platform this year. Today, you can now send to us any of the following types of content, any live streams in these formats, and we'll be able to receive them and process them. So RTMP, a very common format for sending live video streams to the cloud. Or you can pre-encode it with Microsoft Smooth Streaming, or what's called Fragmented MP4. And or you can take the new approach, which we just announced a few weeks ago, which is RTP, or MPEG Transport Streams. Of course, this is the format that most broadcasters use around the world today when they distribute content. You can now take a live feed in MPEG Transport send it to the cloud, and now take advantage of something we just announced, which is called cloud live encoding. This now takes the ability of doing the encoding in the cloud itself. Instead of you having to have a device that sits outside the cloud, a piece of hardware or software that does it for you. Now, this is really awesome when you're talking about trying to do lots of channels that come and go, like the sort of sporting events like I've talked about or a medical conference, or a conference like this. So you can easily spin up a cloud virtual live encoder, run it, encode your live stream, and as soon as that event is over, destroy the virtual encoder, and it's gone. You don't have to have physical assets, physical encoders that you're carrying around, racking and stacking. This is pretty impressive. And the capabilities of our cloud live encoder are exactly what broadcasters and developers like yourself, we think, really need the ability to do multiple layers of video, multi-bit rates, the ability to do audio, to be able to do, <coughs> do closed captioning to meet compliance standards and government standards. And if you're so inclined, you can certainly do ad signaling. If you'd like to place advertisements and slates inside your video that have various ad breaks, all of that is capable now through the cloud. No longer do you have to have a physical device to do this. As I mentioned, of course, Live streaming wouldn't work so well if you could only stream it to one kind of device. So therefore, the Azure Media Services Cloud supports them all. All four major protocols for streaming video adaptively are supported by this cloud. So Apple's HLS, which also allows you to go to iOS and Android devices, as well as many smart TVs. MPEG Dash, which of course is the new IETF's standard for video streaming. Microsoft's smooth streaming format is, continues, will continue to be supported, and even Adobe HDS for Flash-based content. So you see, we support all of the different methodologies for streaming so that you can have the widest audience possible. And then, of course, live wouldn't be as va valuable if you just always gave it away for free. Therefore, you can encrypt your content to protect it and only enable and allow those people who are authorized to see your live stream to see your content, because they require a license key to decrypt it. Now, of course, we didn't stop there. We had to keep enhancing, and that's precisely what we've done. So in addition to the fact that we can scale these origin servers, these streaming servers, to meet an audience of whatever size audience you can attract with your content, whether you're talking about a small audience of a few doctors to millions of people who might be watching the World Cup or the Super Bowl or the Olympic Games, which of course we did in Sochi, Russia a year or so ago and will again in Rio. But there's also some great features that we think make this really exciting and compelling. And as a developer, I'm sure you, can take, you would love to take advantage of them. One of them is called Instantaneous Live to VOD and Cloud DVR. How does this work? Well, imagine you're broadcasting a hockey game. Now, as a viewer, most of us like to try to watch the game end to end. We don't like to enter the game late. 
But sometimes it's an unavoidable. Sometimes we join a live program in progress and we've just missed it. Ah, but with the power of cloud, I want the ability to back it up, to join in the second quarter, but go back to the first, the first period or the first quarter and watch the hockey game from the start. I can do this because the cloud automatically buffers the stream of your live event and turns it into an on demand asset so that your viewers, if you want to give it to them, can instantly watch it at their pace, at their schedule, including the ability to pause live TV. Now, most of you might be thinking this sounds very TiVo y, and of course it is, but there's no TiVo involved. We're using the cloud to do it. And you have that capability when you use Azure Media Services to build an app that takes advantage of those services. Now, there's another part I want to also demonstrate to you, you guys today. And this is something that we call dynamic manifest creation, which I kind of affectionately re-term subclipping. Now, what is this? This is the ability to take a live stream that's running <coughs> and take a highlight from it, a really key, exciting moment from it, and make it available to be viewed by somebody else without them having to jump and find that moment in your live stream. In other words, I'll give you an example. And I'll go back to the laptop to do it. So here I have a subclipper tool. And you'll recognize the same HoloLens video asset that I've put in here. All right? Now, just bear with me. Imagine that this wasn't, in fact, a video asset that I pre recorded, but the live stream, maybe, of the keynote that just happened yesterday or the day before. So this kind of tool will enable me to clip out a moment and send that and save that and share that with my friends. So the live stream is playing. Here it is. And then something really awesome happens, like, oh, I don't know, this really cool view of the HoloLens is sitting on the table. Yeah, I know, this is all not so exciting, but maybe you want something a little bit more exciting. All right, let's, let's dump out of HoloLens. We've probably seen enough of HoloLens this week. Let's go to something more exciting, like, oh, I don't know. How about soccer? Soccer's always very exciting. There we go. So let's say that this live event is going, and it's a soccer game. And something really awesome happens, like, wow, you know, a goal. That goal was so amazing. I, as the owner of the stream, want to share this with my friends. So I'm going to mark that point, a point in time in my live stream, which I'm going to start, and let that run for a little bit and see when the end of my highlighted moment is. Oh, that was a great moment. That was a great moment. That was a great moment. OK, that's good enough. Set out. What have I done? I've just marked 10 seconds of my live stream or of my video asset that I want to share. And now, what, what do I do? Well, go down here. Let me just get rid of the uh, taskbar here. There we go. I'm going to go in here and type in great moment in soccer. And I'm going to grab an image as a thumbnail, and I'm going to publish it. Now, this tool is just an example of how you could create a clip from a live stream. And this clip doesn't really exist. We're creating a virtual clip, a virtual clip that is completely shareable. Here's my clip. I'll play my 10-second clip. Right? See, the time meter is now only 10 seconds. The clip is a clip of a live stream. The live stream might still be happening. That soccer game might still be happening. But you know what? I can't wait for that live event to be over. I want to share this really highlighted magic moment with you. So I'm going to take this, and I'm going to create a URL. Yes, and the orbit has been carefully chosen so with the triangle. All right. Here's the URL of my clip. I'm just showing it so you can see it. Now, what do you notice really interesting about it? This bit right here. I'll zoom in. See this thing called filter name? What I've done is use the cloud to create a dynamic filter, a dynamic clip of a video asset that's still running with a time indicator that tells it. And when I share this video clip with you, I can, I can send it to you if I want. How would I do that? Go back to my friendly neighborhood Azure Media Player. If I stick that URL in the player and play it, Here's my clip, of, uh, oh, except the other clip is still yeah, running in the background. The Here you go. There's my clip, right? Yeah, this, this actually, uh, and now, 
if I go back to the beginning of the demo, you remember? I just can take this, and I can send this URL to all of you. I can email that. And now my clip is even twice as good. It's not only a clip of a live image, a live stream that just happened, but now it's a player that plays the live clip on any device that I send it to. So if I were to text this all to you right now, all of you, just this one clip, I don't have to know what device you're using. I've just sent you a, a clip from a live stream, and you just can play it on any device, any device. That's what the player gives you. So you see, what I've combined is all of these technologies together to give you, the owner of this live stream, this amazing ability to share highlights of live streams with your audience. Now, you can use this for marketing. You could use this to really promote, right? Or you could use it to really build a social environment around, around your content. Imagine what this might mean if you're building applications for sharing videos and exchanging videos, and not just the whole video, but bits of the video, the best parts of video. So all of this, everything that I've just showed you, all available today through developer APIs or through tools like that subclipper tool that I just showed you, which is also just using the APIs. We've just built it around uh, a way for you to see it. Now, of course, live streaming wouldn't be good if you couldn't measure it. You couldn't distribute it around the world. And that's part of what we, we conclude with. So when you, <coughs> when you create these live events, it doesn't matter where the live event is happening. If your audience is around the world, you can do that. Now, how, how is that possible? Why is that so easy? Because very simply, I can say, I want my stream to be made available globally. And we have quite literally, just recently, added a small little checkbox inside of Azure Media Services on the Azure Management Portal that allows you to add what's called a content delivery network, a CDN. All you do have to do is say, I want my streams to automatically go through a CDN so that I can globally distribute it. And this gives you the power to hit all these dots and all of the surrounding miles and hundreds of miles around the dots so that your audiences can grow and grow and grow so you can hit your, hit, send your content wherever you want. And we'll be adding more and more and more of these dots as we, Microsoft, continues to do interconnects with third-party partners all around the world so that you can stream your video content from high, high definition, including 4K, all the way down to low bit rates uh, on cell phones or 3G, 4G networks, wherever your viewers happen to be. So that's kind of the power of using the cloud to distribute your content, especially if it's live. Now, uh, in a little bit, my colleague Ming Fei is going to share with you a little bit more about how to do some of these things, how the live streaming data flow works. And um, the idea, of course, here is that all the components of the cloud now exist, and all of the components of the cloud are available for you. So if you want to spin up a brand new channel, set up a webcam, send that webcam up to the, to, uh, the cloud, whether that webcam is able to spit out a format that's pre-encoded, or maybe it's a camera that's not uh, doing pre-encoding. You want to use the cloud to encode it. You can now send your content up to the cloud and do the live encoding. From there, you could distribute, perhaps by encryption, to our streaming endpoints. And those streaming endpoints will auto-detect who or what device is watching your content so that it'll auto-convert your content into a multitude of different streaming protocols so you can play your content on any device that's in the market today. Of course, if you want to encrypt that content, why shouldn't you? So you encrypt it, and then you set up a license, uh, <coughs> a license delivery mechanism. And we do that as well. That's already provided as part of Azure Media Services. And Ming Fei is going to go into quite a lot of detail around how to use our content protection mechanisms so you can encrypt your content and use the cloud to distribute license keys. License keys that will always be available if, if, the person who's watching and wants to watch your content is so authorized to do that. And that's critical, of course, because now that means that you have full control. And you can integrate with auth systems or Active Directory if you want by doing token exchange in order to say to someone, you should or should not be able to watch my content. So part of putting your content in the cloud is all about protecting that content, distributing that content, but most importantly, making that content as easily accessible and viewable and manipulable by you as any other kind of document or file or any kind of mechanism that we use in Azure today. That's the idea with Azure Media Services. So I'm going to sort of conclude uh, with, with that. Uh, I will <coughs> take some questions at the end. But I want to thank you very, very much for uh, joining this overview session today. 
And uh, I would invite you to take a look at any of the different Azure resources that are, uh, that are available about the Build Conference. And certainly, any of the things that I've just talked about, they're all available for you to try for free. So get yourself an Azure account and just find that button in the management portal that says Azure Media Services. Create a Media Services account, and off you go. And whether you're going to use the developer tool, the uh, Explorer tool that I just showed you to upload and encode, encrypt, and index and publish your content, or you want to do all of that yourself through .NET or Java or build an application that really maps to your need. If you want to incorporate and pull in our player app so that you don't have to build a client app, you can do that. But if you're so inclined, we have SDKs that help you write apps for iOS and Android, Windows as well. So hopefully, we've got everything for you that you need to really get your video content out there, published and viewable, and uh, really, really make uh, the cloud work for your video applications. I hope that this has been helpful. Please don't forget to uh, send us your feedback and, your, and, your, uh, and some comments on how we've done, and I very much thank you. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them about Azure Media Services or any of the things that I've shown uh, at any time. So thank you very much. Yes. Can you hear me? I can. All right. Um, I have a question about the live stream encoding. Uh, for a few months ago, I tried to encode with uh, open broadcaster software, and it didn't work because the Azure Media requires few parameters, like uh, GOP. Is that still a requirement to encode? I'm sorry? Is there a, requ a requirement? Oh, a requirement now. Yes, we, we have all kinds of uh, formats that we can accept. I think I listed the, the three in my, one of my previous slides. So you send it in RTMP, and there's a set of configurations that you have to com your RTMP stream has to comply with. You can send it in Microsoft Smooth, and we'll, we have that. And now the new RTP, which of course will do the encoding not on your local device, but on-prem. So uh, I'd be happy to show you, but all of this information is available through our Azure Media blog, um, which is off of azure.com slash media. But all the information you need to configure your live stream or your, your stream uh, is there, and you would just configure it. And if you're doing your pre-encoding yourself, or if you want to use our new cloud-based encoders, you can. OK, so it does support uh, OBS, Open Broadcast Software. I don't know about that one in particular, but uh, if, if the f protocol supports the three that we supported, then we can take that stream from that. From yeah, that it supports software. RTMP. Then we should be good. Yeah. Okay. And we'll be happy to work with you if, if, you, if it's not quite working out for you. All right. Uh, another question. Sure. Um, the player, uh, does it support Chromecast? Does it run on Chromecast yet? No, I mean, like, can you cast it to Chromecast? That's a good question. I don't know if that's, if that's on our list. Uh, I'll have to go back and look. The, the idea, of course, is that it should run on every browser type that's available today, and Chrome is certainly one of them. So l let's take a look and we'll find out. I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I'll hang around for a little bit. Thank you very much. I hope you'll stick around and join my colleague in about two, five, what, one, at, at two o'clock? Yeah, two? Yeah, so please stick around and, and join her for a deeper dive and take a look at how you can code and develop this stuff. But thank you, and enjoy the rest of your build, and have a safe trip home. Bye-bye. <laughs>